All right, so the key question we're gonna look at in this video is how should product leaders think about revenue models? Remember, if the overall goal here is to help with financial literacy for product leaders, with the atomic unit being products, not companies, then it becomes really important that the individual way that each product delivers value back to the company be well understood. And so in today's talk, we're really gonna try to do two things. First of all, I wanna make sure you're comfortable with a couple definitions up front. And more than just defining these terms, I wanna make sure you're thinking about really this concept of how should a product leader think about a revenue model. And then we'll walk through some common revenue models uh, for different types of products. Okay, so first of all, let's look at these kind of definitions of revenue models and make sure we're just all on the same page with what do we mean when we use the term revenue model? And I think part of the confusion around this comes from many, many leaders and companies, whether these are small startups, investors, or product leaders in very large companies, end up interchangeably using the term business model and revenue model. But a revenue model and a business model are not the same thing. So when we think about a business model, I'm inclined to point back to Alex Osterwalder and the work that he did, right? And he defines a business model as the rationale for how an organization creates, delivers, and captures value. And I'm guessing most of you are familiar with Alex's work, but just as a reminder, if not, Alex did his PhD uh, broadly on some work that ultimately became the book Business Model Generation back in 2010 uh, that, that went on to become a, a bestseller and, and create the consulting firm that he continues to lead today, Strategizer. But between that dissertation and the bestseller, unlike many PhDs, his dissertation immediately began to be used by lots of people in industry. Folks like Deloitte, Ericsson, 3M took his concept from his dissertation and, and actually translated it into how they were working. And if you think about it, uh, if you're not familiar with the canvas and the work, really what Alex was doing is he was saying, okay, th this concept of how, an how, a, how a company does these three things, creates, delivers, and captures value, you can break it into some kind of common common segments or, or a, a taxonomy, if you will. And, and then you can do that at multiple levels. So at the top level, you can think about a, a business model as just really, really kind of four blocks. First of all, kind of who is the customer for this product or, or business? What uh, value do those customers get from the organization? And then how does the organization deliver it? So you can really think about the who and the how as sales and delivery or the front of house and the back of house of an organization. And then along the bottom, you can think about kind of the, the, the revenue and cost part of it, or how does the company make money and what does it cost them to create the products that make that money? So that's one way to look at it, but, but Alex actually ultimately breaks it down into nine building blocks where the, the customer block, that, that who part, is broken down into three blocks, the customer segment, the customer relationships, and the channels. And, and then the, the how block is broken down again into three blocks where you've got key partnerships, key activities, and key resources. And then that, that translation from the back of house to the front of house or sales back to delivery. That's kind of the value proposition in the middle. And now we've got cost structure for what does it take to do the back of the house and the revenue streams for what does it take to do to the front of the house. And then the cost and revenue kind of intersect right at value proposition. So this is a helpful model to, to think about how these business models work. And you can imagine going through and answering each of these nine categories of questions to help you understand the business model that you have in mind. And, and when you fill that out, then you end up with this, this kind of complete set of assumptions around how a business can organize, create, deliver, and capture value. So if that's kind of what a business model is, right, then, then you're probably already beginning to understand that, that a subset of a business model would be a revenue model. And the revenue model really focuses on the how. How does an organization capture value? Right, and you can think about revenue models at the product level similarly. So a product or a service, delivers value to a customer segment, how does the company that that product or service is being created by capture part of the value that they're creating for those customers? And when you think about a revenue model this way, you can understand how important for product leaders it will be to really have a crisp understanding around what their revenue model is, because it will be this key input into all the different types of financial modeling that, that they do. It'll be a key input into questions like, well, how big is this opportunity if we're ultimately successful? And it'll be crucial to make sure that the customers are comfortable exchanging this value for the products or services that you're delivering. Now on the slide here, you'll see that I'm talking about company slash product in each of those three categories. And, and the reason for that is that in many small companies, these are often used interchangeably, right? When companies are starting, they typically have one primary product or one primary suite of products 
and, and so product and company can be used interchangeably. But as companies get larger, you have different product lines with different customer bases, and, and you really end up with these, these revenue models per product. And then you're going to answer these same questions, not at the company level, but at the product level. And this gets back to, again, the essence of really what we're going to talk about across all nine of these videos, which is that you want to be thinking about your revenue model, and you want to be thinking about your product and the financial metrics around your product more generally at using the product as the core unit, not the overall company. So hopefully that provides a little bit of clarity with when we use the term revenue model, what are we talking about? Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to kind of go through some common revenue models. The reality is when you're first starting out with an idea you have, you may not actually know the right revenue model. And, and, and so you, you might have a hypothesis about, okay, here's generally what I think is the right revenue model for this product but you may not know exactly the right revenue model. You also may not completely yet know exactly how to think about, is the revenue model that I already have the right revenue model going forward? You know, companies over time sometimes actually innovate by pivoting the revenue model. You know, one common example of this is companies moving from a transactional revenue model to a subscription revenue model. And when I say that, everybody's mind immediately goes to thinking about software and software as a service as a revenue model. But we've also seen companies like Panera Bread here move from, you know, selling coffee to people every time they walk through the doors to a model where customers sign up for a monthly subscription for as much coffee as they want. So again, uh, you, you may have a revenue model that's working today and you may need to be asking yourself, how do I tweak it or optimize it? You also may need to ask yourself, okay, maybe I need to think about innovating and looking at other revenue models. Or you may be just starting out with the product or service you have in mind. And you may just have a guess on which of these revenue models makes sense. But coming back to why these revenue models are so important, it's going to be a key input to so much of the rest of what you'll do that it's really important to get this clear. And so what I want to do here is I want to walk through each of these common revenue models, quickly make sure we're, again, defined on, on what it is, give you some examples. And then I'm going to go back to that business model canvas and show you the different blocks of the business model canvas that that revenue model will influence. So, so the easiest by far to understand is per transaction revenue model. I don't know, but I'm pretty sure this is the oldest of all the revenue models. And the point here is someone creates a product or service and then someone comes and purchases that from them. And, and they don't do it on a, on a regular basis. They do it in a very episodic or infrequent way. So, you know, someone creates a car and someone buys a car. Some company may buy a warehouse or you may buy a home. Uh, a company may purchase a piece of manufacturing equipment. These are large purchases in general. We'll get to smaller, more frequent purchases in just a moment. But the key question as a product leader to ask yourself when you're thinking about is a per transaction revenue model really the right revenue model for me is how do I maximize the value per transaction, right? If you're going to sell a car to a customer every three, four years, and you, you know, certainly getting them to come back and buy again three or four years later is important, but you want to make sure every time they walk through that door, you're maximizing the value to you of that transaction by delivering them the right amount of value and capturing as much of that as possible. That leads to the second question, which is often, you know, are there ways to, to have add-on products or add-on services that I can bundle to these transactions? It's also worth pointing out, we tend to think of these primarily initially in the context of businesses selling to consumers. But when you think about businesses selling to other businesses, these kind of large purchases are typically looked at as a capitalized expense. And so that's part of the psychology that the customer will have as they're evaluating making a purchase on this per transaction revenue model. And so when you think about what are the blocks that are important here, again, this is a pretty simple, pretty classic business model. When you're thinking about this kind of revenue model, you really want to focus on the value proposition and the, the revenue stream, right? So the revenue stream is going to be a cost per unit, again, maybe with some add-on options. And, and the value proposition is going to be, right, someone comes to you with a problem and you're, and you're solving it, right? It's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. I have, a trans, I have a transportation problem. They solve it for me. And the value that the customer is getting back from this is that they're owning the thing when they're done with it. Very similar to the per transaction revenue model is a per use revenue model. Here we're talking about something which in many ways you're still owning, but the good is now more perishable. So instead of buying a house, now our example might be purchasing a cup of coffee or on the service side, uh, this might be like hiring a repairman to come in and solve a problem for you. Now, because these purchases are more frequent, now, as a product leader, you're going to start looking at less about maximizing the value per transaction and instead think about more maximizing the value across the lifetime of that customer. You want to make sure that it works on a 
per transaction or, or, or per use basis. So you still want to look at things like gross margin per use, uh, but, you, but you're again sort of focused now on a use by use basis and then the value you're driving across all of those. And, and as I alluded to when I was setting up the different types of revenue models, this is uh, often an opportunity to take these per use revenue models and ask yourself the question, is there a way to make this more profitable, deliver more value to the customer, make both sides happy, where we shift to the next revenue model we're going to talk about, which is a subscription one. Uh, this is typically on the B2B side, not looked at as a CapEx anymore, but now it's an occasional operational expense or occasional OpEx, right? So slightly different buyer psychology. The, the business model canvas blocks here are very similar to the last one, as you would expect. But again, the value has changed a little bit from owning it to getting that value on demand when you have the problem that you have. Okay, now we want to move to a little bit more interesting or, or maybe uh, emerging more and more common business models. And the first of those that we're going to look at is subscription revenue models. So the easy example here is obviously the as a service technology offering, software as a service, infrastructure as a service. And those are easy and, and frankly great examples. But I would just want to point out, like even on the consumer side, this is not a new thing that people also have been buying cable subscriptions for a long time or, or phone bundle, phone service whether that's cellular or more historically, uh, actual telephone, phone service to them. Uh, so people have been selling things on a subscription basis for a long time, memberships, et cetera. Uh, but, but really technology has made this really interesting as we think about the as a service offerings for a lot of technology companies. And then as mentioned in the introduction of these um, business models, you see companies like Panera on the retail side now applying this to how they do business as well. And when you think about this subscription revenue model, now the question of this really moves to more like, okay, I still want to think about lifetime value like I did in the last revenue model, but now I want to think about not just what's the lifetime value, assuming they continue to buy it over and over again, but how long is the customer contractually obligated to work with me? And then uh, what did it cost me to acquire that customer? How long will it take me to pay back the money that I spent to acquire that customer? And then is there a way every time that contract comes up for renewal or even just through use of the product where I can uh, get them to spend more money or, or increase their subscription value with me to ultimately deliver what's called net negative churn. And the concept behind net negative churn is that for any group of customers that you have, so say that you know, the customers I signed up over this defined quarter or month or half a year or a year, over future cohorts of that, am I able to get those customers to spend more money with me for who continue to work with me such that the money those are spending incrementally more with me is greater than the people who choose not to renew or who, who what's called churn out. And so if you can have more expansion revenue than revenue you lose via churn, you end up with net negative churn, which ultimately obviously makes the subscription model incredibly powerful because it means all of these revenue uh, interactions that you're getting or the, these groups of customers, they're just growing and compounding quarter over quarter, year over year. Oh, it's worth saying as well that when a, on the business to business side of this, when thinking about the customer psychology here, a customer is really going to think about this as a run rate operational expense now, not, a, not an occasional operational expense. So the, the, you know, the, we're still really just focused on those two building blocks. We will move in a moment here to some, some revenue models that involve more of the, the uh, elements of the business model canvas. But the key point here now is that the, the value proposition is moving from thinking about like, oh, when do I have this problem? How do I solve it to? I just don't want to think about this problem at all. And I just want to rent the worry-free, this is available when I need it. And obviously the that relates to then a revenue stream, which is recurring. Okay, let's move to uh, an, an even more uh, maybe digitally common, but, uh, but increasingly popular revenue model as well, which is freemium. Now, when we talk about freemium, this is not the same thing as ad supported. You know, people often, when you talk about freemium, will use examples like Facebook or Google. Facebook and Google are not freemium revenue models, at least not, you know, Google search, you as a consumer going to Google and searching, or you going to Instagram or Facebook and using the product. Unless you buy ads from Google or Facebook or Instagram, you are not the customer of those products. You are the product of those products. But when you think about a freemium, what I'm talking about is products where there's a certain cohort of customers who use the product for free. And those customers are complemented by a advanced set of users who pay for the product. Examples of this would include Skype, 
Evernote and Dropbox, right? So you can think about Skype or Evernote or Dropbox. You could be a free user of those products and get a certain set of features, or you could be a paid user and get even more features back, right? And so the questions that are important as a product leader when you're thinking about a freemium revenue model is what percentage of these overall customers convert from free to paid? And then very much related to that, a really crucial question is, is there a less expensive way to sign up paid customers than offering a free version? And, and if the answer to that is, is yes, then you really want to ask yourself, well, are the free users offering any additional value? So certainly in some cases they are. There are businesses like communication platforms like Skype, where the value of the overall network grows having more and more people connected to it. So having a bunch of free users on Skype really makes the overall value for the paid and the free users greater. There's, in other words, there's kind of network effects there. But when you think about a product like Dropbox, it, it really, if there were a cheaper way to sign people up for Dropbox, then that would be the smart way for Dropbox to operate. And in fact, uh, there are examples of early in Dropbox's history, them trying to sign customers up with things like digital advertising. But it turns out providing this low-end free offering of Dropbox is actually a better way to sign people up for Dropbox than offering a paid version of it. On the B2B side, the, the value here that we don't want to miss is that also this is often a really great way to get customers started uh, because typically you can do this without getting procurement involved. And it allows companies to have a bunch of bottom-up, i.e. end users who are getting value from the product, maybe putting it on their corporate credit card, start using it before you do kind of an enterprise top-down sale. Now, I said the last couple uh, revenue models that we're going to get to examples where it's not just value proposition and revenue streams. And this is the first example of this. We're adding in now the element from the business model canvas looking at customer segments. And here you can see the color-coded dots around the customer segment value proposition and revenue stream, how you have really two different customer segments. You have the casual customer segments whose value proposition is some basic set of features and revenue stream is free. And then you have the high volume or high value customers who get some premium set of features and pay you for it. Right, so now we've got who the customer segments are, two different groups, and then those drive different value propositions and different revenue streams. Just to hit a couple more of these, I also want to talk about marketplace revenue models. So when you think about a marketplace revenue model, really the connection, what you're doing here is you're connecting two different groups of customers or two different groups of, people, of constituents within your platform together, and, and your value is really delivering those connections. So in the case of Uber, this is connecting riders with drivers. In the case of eBay, it's connecting buyers with sellers. And certainly there are cases where sellers become buyers or people use Uber both as a platform to drive and a platform to get rides. But you can think about them as really two different key groups that the marketplace is getting value delivering these connections between the two. So some questions you want to think about with a revenue model that is a marketplace as a product leader is, is there a way to make sure that you don't get disintermediated or the, the, what's often called leakage out of the model, right? Where people stop using your marketplace connection to connect buyers and sellers and instead directly start working with each other. So this might be like you say to your Uber driver, hey, can I have your cell phone? I'll just text you the next time I need a ride. Or you stay at an Airbnb through Airbnb and then you ask the host if next time you can just book directly through them. That would be examples of leakage. You also want to make sure that both sides, the supply and the demand side, the drivers and passengers or the sellers and buyers are fragmented enough that there's value in actually being the connectivity between the two. And, and you want to make sure that you're able to make sure the marketplace grows in balance, where as you add, for example, Uber, as Uber added drivers, they wanted to make sure they were also adding uh, riders. And, and, and that ultimately leads to some interesting uh, network effects. On the B2B side, when you're thinking about someone in a B2B setting doing this, one key question that they need to think about is, what really are the economic advantages of working uh, through this marketplace versus directly working with the supplier? Now, what we're going to do in terms of our, of our business model canvas, mapping this back to the revenue model, is we're going to try to segment out the supply side of that from the demand side of it. So we're going to call the demand side of this the customer. So in the case of Uber, this would be the, the riders. In the case of eBay, this would be the buyers. And then we're going to talk about the supply side as the sellers or the drivers. And the value proposition, right, is those two meeting in the middle and connecting supply and demand. And most typically, the revenue stream here would be some percentage of that transaction that the marketplace captures. There are exceptions, but generally that's how the revenue stream works here. Okay, I alluded to this earlier, but I do want to sort of come back to this concept of indirect revenue models and 
digital advertising is the 800 pound gorilla in this example. So again, this is not freemium. This is where customers are being, or this is where customers are buying an aggregated set of people who use a product or service. So Google is selling the attention of the millions and millions of people who are constantly using their search engine to find information. Facebook and Instagram are selling the hundreds and hundreds of millions of people every day who are scrolling through their platform and their attention, right? And so the question that you need to think about here is from a customer's perspective, is this the, the most efficient way to capture those people's attention? And uh, can you convince customers that this free service that you're offering them is worth bartering that for their attention? And so you can think about this again, where now we as the people using those products and services are on the key partnership side. We're the consumers of that product and we're being connected with advertisers. And the revenue model here might be cost per impression, cost per click, cost per some kind of action. This concept of a revenue model is absolutely key because understanding the revenue model helps customers understand the, the value that is being exchanged between them and the product. And you as a product leader really begin to model out the different financial implications and think about many of the things that we'll build on in the rest of these lectures, looking at how product managers and product leaders should think about these key financial concepts.